My name is Ethan Buckman. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Fredo's. And I'm excited for today. We, we saw very, very high demand for this uh, session. And I think I understand why. Um, when I look at the way that I interact with mechanics, when my car breaks down, I know that the number one thing that I need to do when I bring my broken car to a mechanic is to ask a question that doesn't show how little I understand what's wrong with my car. But I know how important that is. I know how critical it is to make sure that people understand that on top of my game. Uh, so knowing the right questions to ask your supplier when you're importing is no less important. Uh, today, we're going to have uh, two speakers. The first is Shen Huang, who runs supply chain strategy and operations at Alibaba.com North America. And the second is Ari Corman from the Fredos.com side, who is our VP sales. Again, my name is Eitan Buckman, or Ethan Buckman, as it says in Zoom. Uh, and I'm the chief marketing officer here at the Fredos Group. Uh, before I get started, uh, I got this cool shirt that says I make freight look good. If you want to get a cool shirt that says get shit done, if you hear anything interesting uh, or any interesting insights while we're doing this presentation, head into LinkedIn or Twitter, share that insight with your crew, um, write learn more at ship.alibaba.com and then tag alibaba.com. We'll go through the comments that people leave afterwards and send one person a t-shirt. So again, just drop an insight on LinkedIn or Twitter that you pick up in this webinar, uh, click write learn more at ship.alibaba.com and then tag alibaba.com and you could get a cool freight t-shirt. Boom. Uh, so let's dive in today to the actual rundown of what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna start off with four questions that you need to know when you're importing in order to ask your supplier. The second thing we're gonna do is a very, very quick uh, Alibaba.com freight walkthrough to show a little bit of what it looks like. And the third is questions and answers. Now we got over 500 questions in advance, so I have a whole long list. We're also gonna be watching the chat pretty carefully. So if you have questions, drop them in there. I can't promise that we're gonna to get to it, but we'll do our best to try to get as many as possible. Uh, without further ado, uh, maybe Shannon Ari, do you wanna just uh, turn on, yeah, do you wanna say hi for a second and introduce yourselves really briefly? Hi, yes, sure. Uh, my name is Chen Huang, uh, you know, uh, lead at Alibaba Supply Chain Strategy and Operations uh, in New York, currently in South Carolina. So, um, you know, <laughs> nice to be here um, and, you know, good to chat with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ari Corman, uh, Vice President of Sales and Customer Success at Freitas. And it's really, really a great opportunity to speak with you all today and uh, hopefully answer as many questions as possible about the uh, shipping process. It's I know it could be confusing, but it doesn't have to be. And we're really, really excited to be here today. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So as I said before, we're going to start off with four questions that you need to know to ask your supplier. Uh, this will pay, take about 15 minutes. We'll do that quick, like one minute run through of Alibaba Freight. And then after that, we'll get to the questions that you've submitted in advance. Again, we're looking at chat the entire time. So if you have any questions, drop them there. Uh, with that, uh, why don't you uh, take it away, Shen? Great. So... All right. Well, for those of you that are uh, new to this, you know, uh, webinar, good to have you here. So the first question that we're, you know, really hoping that you can understand, right? This may seem like a very obvious question to you to ask your supplier, what a unit cost, right? Based on the specific uh, trade term. So this is really, um, you know, what differentiates an experienced B2B international buyer from the novice ones, right? Is knowing the nuance of this question and uh, including the international trade term as part of your asks. So for those that need a refresher on Incoterms real quick, right? These acronyms provide one universal definition for a series of tasks, responsibilities, you know, liabilities for shipment of the goods. So INCO terms will ultimately determine your shipping costs and, you know, will impact your total product cost and is, you know, truly the foundation of your trade assurance or uh, contract on Alibaba.com. And here's a quick uh, graphic that explains, you know, who's responsible for what. So for instance, um, XWorks, uh, you know, EXW means that the supplier will have the goods ready for pickup uh, at the factory as it is not available, uh, not responsible for the product once it leaves the factory doors. So the buyer, you, is responsible for transporting it all the way from the factory and is responsible for all costs from that moment on to your final destination, right? Well, FOB means that the seller ships the goods to the nearest port and is responsible for clearing the goods for export at the, uh, you know, origin. And the buyer is responsible for uh, the goods from the port onwards and everything after that. And there's a bunch of C terms here, right? CPT, CIF, CFR, 
little confusing, but generally they mean that the buyer bears the cost and risk until the order is delivered at the destination port. So CRF means your supplier is responsible for right, uh, you know, cost insurance freight for arranging transportation to the destination port, uh, including minimum insurance. So by default, now you may be wondering, right, a CIF unit cost would be higher than FOB unit cost or, you know, exports unit cost, right? Uh, why? Because the supplier really has to spend time and energy on arranging transportations for you, therefore making the total product cost higher. And that can really add up when you're ordering large quantities. So really when it comes to your freight orders that are high in commercial value, um, you know, we recommend that you actually use buyer-driven INCO terms such as FOB, FCA, uh, XWorks, allowing you to have more control, uh, pricing, and transparency. So making sure that you're asking the unit cost by trade term is really what's going to differentiate you from, you know, the novice uh, international buyers. And, and Shen, just to jump in, I, I think that that's such an important point. Uh, what, what this, I guess, is broadly more related to is just the general landed cost, right? Knowing that when you speak to somebody, it's never just about the actual cost of the goods. It's what happens when you start factoring your shipping costs, your customs brokerage, everything else that needs to get thrown on top of it. And if you're fulfilling on Amazon, obviously, the individual costs associated with that. And, and I, I totally agree with you. I think that you know, people tend to look at the alphabet soup of letters and get very intimidated. This is by far the best graphic I've ever seen that explains it. Um, and of course, everybody will be sending out a recording and, and the uh, slides after this. So don't worry, you'll, you'll get this. Mm -hmm. Great. And then another key question that you definitely need to ask your supplier is really the HS code for your product, right? So HS codes or harmonized system codes are, you know, is essentially a standardized international system to classify globally traded products. So HS codes are six digits. Your supplier should already know the HS codes, right? If the same product has been exported before. And why are they important? Well, for one, it's universal. So whether you're importing baby high chairs into the United States or Singapore, the first six digits of the HS code is the same. So two, countries then, you know, make break down the classification down further uh, by adding two to six digits after the first, um, you know, six digits. So this country specific number uh, is called, you know, harmonized tariff schedule. So HTS codes in the U.S. In general, duties and taxes are, um, you know, assessed by, uh, you know, based on the origin of the product, commercial value of the shipment, detailed product descriptions, as well as HS codes and, you know, country uh, trade agreements and tariff schedules. So regardless of which INCO terms, right, you know, there's a long list of them that we just mentioned before, uh, you know, regardless of which one you're using, it's really important to figure out the HS codes for your catalog because uh, not only do they impact your landed cost, uh, since duties and taxes are always part of the equation, but also impact requirements, right? That certain, let's say, partner government agencies, you know, such as the FDA, EPA, uh, CPSC, right, or Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, you know, that will impose on the importers. So really, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you as an importer is always responsible for ensuring the product certification compliance, uh, you know, when bringing the products in. So you should never just, you know, rely on your supplier's words, right? Ask your supplier whether they can provide previous test report that proves the supplier is compliant with the standards. If the product can contain, uh, let's say, lithium batteries, make sure your supplier provides the MSDS uh, material safe, uh, safety data sheets that will impact your shipping options. So we definitely recommend working closely with a customs broker to ensure that you have the right documentations, uh, certificates to be compliant, and then that can help you avoid headaches, you know, delays and maybe fees down the road. And one of my, actually, one of my favorite hacks when I'm kind of researching products or trying to figure out HS codes, you know, whether I'm sourcing something or not, I'll actually go to Google, I'll write in the name of the product, Alibaba HS, because so many suppliers uh, list their HS code within the product description, which is always, you know, you can't always necessarily count on it being the exact right HS code, as Jen said, but it's a very, very helpful guide when you're trying to get started and want to figure out what the right, uh, what the right duties will be for your specific product. Um, so yeah, definitely a, a good tip if you're trying to go um, start uh, sourcing a new product. Um, moving over to you, Ari, your next question. Great. Here. Th thank you, Xian. Um, so in the same uh, vein of what uh, Sean was speaking about, it's really important to look at 
the overall landing cost of your product, right? And it, th these are the kinds of questions you want to ask your supplier to determine if, uh, ultimately how much will it actually cost to not only source the product, but to then ship the product and then deliver the product to your end customers. So a very important question around the actual uh, size of your shipment is specifically how are you actually packaging uh, the shipment, right? Uh, it may sound like a basic question, but you do want to make sure that you get uh, things like a packing list uh, and you know the total weight and total volume uh, regarding the uh, the product that you're shipping because it does have a significant impact on the total cost really across your supply chain. So from the beginning, uh, in terms of the uh, pickup, in terms of the main freight uh, from port to port, and then finally when you're when you're fulfilling the orders to your customers in the U.S. or Canada, Europe, et cetera, the total landed cost uh, that you can uh, that you can envision. So it all starts with the packaging, and um, this is a, this is especially sensitive uh, when it comes to air shipping uh, and express, uh, where you know volumetric weight or chargeable weight. In other words, the uh, equivalent weight from a volume standpoint that your uh, product takes up is how the airlines um, and express providers will calculate the weight that you will be uh, responsible for. So can't under, uh, uh, underestimate how important this is to do. It also does impact ultimately, of course, the, um, you know, the, the quality that it's the, in, in which it's packaged. And that also bears um, you know, relevance for uh, how it's stored, how it's uh, you know, kept in the warehouse, and ultimately what is the chance that your end product will be delivered to your customers uh, in a high quality fashion. So again, it really is about cost and all about, and about the final uh, delivery to your customers, uh, ask, asking how will this thing, uh, how will my product be packaged? Um, and it's interesting in speaking to many, many customers um, in terms of what kinds of, you could say unintended charges or things that they didn't expect, um, you would know about 30% uh, or more of the unintended um, charges or kind of increases in charges actually stem from uh, additional weights or additional volumes that potentially came up due to poor packaging. Maybe things were not t packaged correctly. They were packaged with uh, incorrectly. Uh, they were using too many boxes. So this is a very important to obviously keep your pricing and your overall uh, um, charges to a minimum. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, the fourth of our questions uh, that you uh, want to make sure. Actually, before you oh, go ahead, to that fourth Ethan, one, yes. Yeah, I just I just want to double click on this one for one second because. What I've seen happen is the most frustrating part of working with a with, when you're importing your goods, you, you get into you can occasionally get into this very frustrating dynamic where you end up getting pay, needing to pay the logistics provider a little bit more. And what Ari is saying about the the size and weight is so fundamental because if you have the wrong data on the size of your goods post packaging and you give that to the logistics provider, when the logistics provider ships that he ends up paying more, which means that you need to end up paying more. And it causes so much frustration for both the importer and for the logistics provider that just that one question, if you walk out of this webinar and you just know that you need to ask the supplier, what is the full size weight? What are the dimensions of these goods once they're packaged correctly? Uh, I promise you that will save you a lot of angst down the road. Sorry uh, for cutting you off, Ari. Yeah. You. No, it's... And, and it's also more predictable, right? So then when you end up getting quotes uh, and freight quotes, you don't have the unintended things. You know exactly the weight, the volume, and the costs uh, associated with it. Um, so the, uh, the final question here, and there's, gonna be, there's a lot more. These are just the four. You know, we spent many, many hours trying to find the four best questions to ask. When will my product be ready to ship? Every customer we speak with, this is something that, uh, that, is, that comes up, right? When will my product uh, be ready to ship? And why is that? Because there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, I guess, consequences of this question. I would start with the impact of cash flow. Um, you, need to basic, you need to pay your supplier, depending on the supplier, whether it's a third before production, a third during production, a third after production, or half prior, half after, whatever the configuration is, there's a, there's a direct consequence between how much cash you need to pay your supplier uh, and then when you need to pay them and when the shipment is actually uh, produced. So cash flows, is, is, cash is very, very important, especially for you know, entrepreneurs, for small businesses. So this helps you plan out uh, your supplier payments. It also will help you ultimately, as I mentioned before in the packaging uh, item and that Xi'an mentioned in regards to HS code, it's all about projecting your, not only your freight costs, but your duties, as well as the ultimate landing costs. So when you'll be able to ship is also an important question of, 
is the, you know, the quotes I'm getting from my freight providers, are they within the validity period? When is my shipment ready to actually, uh, you know, be picked up and ship? Uh, and in the volatile period that we're in, uh, obviously with COVID-19, which is not going away, unfortunately, there is a fair amount of volatility. So it's in extremely important to know, you know, when will your shipment actually be produced? And if you're shipping for multiple suppliers, you know, having a very, very good inventory management system or any other way to make sure that you're on top of each shipment, you know, when will the production be completed so that you can ultimately calculate the lead time uh, between production and when you will get that product out to your final customers and giving yourself, of course, a little bit of uh, bandwidth there, uh, a little bit of margin on uh, the destination side in case there are any sort of unexpected um, occurrences. And in terms of buffers and margins, uh, that obviously comes up in terms of lead time, um, but it also comes up in every aspect of the supply chain. So it comes up when calculating your margins, it comes up when calculating your supplier payments, it, it comes up when calculating the overall lead time to, to get the product to your, to your end customers. Always kind of err on the side of, uh, of a little bit of uh, additional margin in everything you do. So again, the fourth question, when will my product be ready to ship? That you should always ask your suppliers. Cool, and, and before we move on, I think I, I saw two questions pop up here that I think are relevant to touch on for a second. Uh, Carlos asked about size versus weight when shipping. If you have a relatively larger box, but it's very light in weight, will it change freight prices? And that's what Ari was alluding to when he talked about the volumetric weight, uh, that typically uh, logistics providers will control for that and basically charge you either by weight or by size, uh, usually whichever one is more expensive. Uh, one fun way to overcome this if you're a little bit more advanced is mixing the goods, right? Where you ship larger and lighter things together with heavier and smaller things. Um, another question that came in from Riza, uh, Shen, maybe this one is uh, better for you on the Alibaba side, is you know, many times, uh, Riza said that many times she asked a supplier, when is the product ready to ship? But sometimes there's some long delays and the supplier can deliver the goods on time. Uh, any suggestions on, on how to overcome that? Yes, absolutely. And that's a great question, right? How do we ensure that, you know, we're holding the suppliers accountable? So that's why on Alibaba.com, we actually have this product trade assurance. Essentially, it's an escrow payment production program. So, you know, in your trade assurance contract, right, you would, you know, similar to your traditional performa invoice, uh, you will list your trade terms, your unit cost, transportation, who's responsible for what, right, the actual con uh, contract itself. And in there, we actually allow the buyer and seller to agree on a, a specific date, a shipment date. So let's say, you know, you, uh, your supplier is responsible for, uh, you know, shipment, let's say 80, 80 days after this particular day or, you know, 20, let's say 70%, uh, you know, after payment or things like that. So you can actually specify in your trade assurance contract. Um, so that's why we encourage buyers, uh, you know, customers in general to use trade assurance um, so that your supplier is actually responsible for ensuring that the goods are shipped on time. Right. So if they're not, then you can actually then file a dispute and, you know, um, hopefully we won't get to that. But, you know, that's at least one other way to hold your suppliers accountable and, and ensuring, you know, good communications throughout, I would say, is definitely key. Um, and if a supplier keeps, you know, pushing back and giving you excuses, I think that's when, you know, the alarms will, you know, I, I would say I would be cautious about that. Awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I would just add on that them. point uh, also that building a relationship with your supplier is really, really important. And you'll find that as you ship once or twice, you know, starting from kind of a sample to then, you know, uh, working with a supplier once, twice, three times or, or longer is really crucial to the question of, of the production time, because as you have things kind of on regular production, you have then less issues when it comes to delays, things are kind of on a regular cadence, but it also helps you when it comes to important points, like I alluded to when it comes to, uh, cash flow and trade finance. So, you know, suppliers that are used to working with you then on subsequent shipments will then be more open and more flexible as well uh, when it comes to uh, trade to trade finance and uh, when they require payment. Okay, cool. All right. So, so moving on, uh, just a, a quick kind of 60 second refresher, if you haven't played around with, uh, with Alibaba.com freight uh, before. Um, I see a question coming in right now from Megan. Are you saying that you don't have to pay all monies upfront? Uh, Frequently when you're sourcing goods, the way that that'll happen is that you'll pay uh, about a third of it up front and then another two thirds before the goods ship out. Uh, but you can come to individual arrangements with your specific supplier. So it, it can differ a little bit. Um, 
in terms of in terms of uh, the logistics providers, when you ship on Alibaba.com freight, uh, you, you do pay upfront, uh, but we hold that in escrow before it goes over to the actual logistics provider. So we're talking about Alibaba.com freight, uh, this is what it briefly looks like. Of course, you could head to ship that Alibaba.com to kick the tires yourself. Uh, really, we, our goal together is to make this as simple as possible. So you can choose on the top whether you're shipping loose cargo or full container loads. Uh, after that, you'll put in some more details around the customs, additional services you need, whether you need insur- whether you need insurance for your products, and we always recommend that you do that um, so that you don't take a big hit if something goes wrong. And ship does happen when you're uh, shipping goods. Uh, once you put in your search query, you'll get the results from a bunch of different logistics providers. Uh, what we pride ourselves on is having the all-in cost. So assuming that what you put in is correct, right? Those size and dimensions that we talked about are all there. Uh, you'll be able to see the full in uh, uh, the full in price, uh, and clicking on any quote will give you the breakdown of the individual surcharges that are there. When you click select and book, you'll be able to pay online with your credit card. Uh, once you have your shipments booked, this basically basically becomes a one-stop shop to manage all of your shipments regardless of which logistics providers you're shipping with. And this is crucial, means that even if you're shipping simultaneously with three or four different shipments, one by air, a couple by ocean, uh, you can manage them all in one place uh, and get a bird's eye view of your supply chain. Uh, You can also use this platform to manage all of your documentation. So if you need to upload your commercial invoice, power of attorney, packing lists that I already talked about before, this basically becomes your one-stop shop. Uh, so you can uh, head over there afterwards and kick the tires a little bit. Uh, try it out yourself. It's totally free, and you can log in with your Alibaba um, with your Alibaba account. Uh, I'm done talking about Alibaba Freight. Let's dive directly into the questions and answers. And again, thank you very much for all those questions in advance and for keeping them coming right now. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, which is more than I thought we would have right now. So uh, I think we're a, a little bit relaxed. Um, the first question that I wanted to kind of throw in here is really a couple of different questions. Uh, that one person emailed me right before the show, but right before we started, and I think encapsulated so many. So I'm new to importing. What kind of fees should I expect? Can product be delivered to residential address? Let's pick this apart and just answer each one individually. Um, Ari, let's start with you. What kind of fees fees uh, should somebody expect when importing products into the U.S.? Yeah. So, so this really uh, the first part of the answer here is the inco term or the commercial term that you're shipping on. Uh, and we can bring maybe up that uh, diagram again that Xi'an had showed. This is really the first question about what fees you can expect and whether you're going to be owning the shipment really from all the way from the supplier to the final address in the US, for example, or, or whichever destination country. Obviously, that will cost a lot more than if you're shipping on FOB, the fourth term there on the left, which means that you're only responsible for shipping from the uh, port, for example, Shanghai port to your final destination. So in terms of fees, it really does, uh, it's very impactful uh, vis-a-vis which uh, INCO term or trade term uh, that you're shipping on. Um, It's a very good point regarding residential address. So even if you're a business, even if you're selling on Amazon, you can still ship to a residential address, uh, you know, on Alibaba Freight uh, powered by Freydus. You can easily tick a box uh, that you want to ship to residential. Usually there's a very nominal fee of $50 to $100 or so uh, to do that. Uh, This is also very good if you want to do your own kind of um, inspection of the goods, maybe if it's your first time working with a supplier or you want to just take a look at what these these goods actually look like and hold them up. Uh, So yes, you can absolutely ship to a residential uh, address. Um, In terms of cutting costs, and then uh, we'll, I guess, uh, move it over to Xi'an to answer the second half. Um, In terms of the best way to cut costs, um, I would say aligning with your uh, supplier on the INCO term. I cannot you know, th- this is really crucial because if you do not align uh, on the correct INCO term, uh, in other words, FOB or XWorks, you will usually be overpaying by many hundreds of dollars because you're, uh, you, you simply will not be aligned with who's paying what. Uh, so I would say that is the best way to cut costs, which is to make sure that you're aligned on the INCO terms with your supplier. Absolutely. Xian, do you want to answer the next half of the questions? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so, you know, most cost-effective way to get the product uh, shipped into the U.S. Well, it depends 
right? Um, so if you're only shipping, let's say, 20 units of, uh, I don't know, cell phones or, you know, purses, uh, these are tiny items that can fit into, let's say, parcel boxes, then you may not even need a freight shipment, right? So it really depends on the quantities that you're ordering, the weights, the volume uh, of the shipment, and how they're packaged, right? So, you know, definitely get that information. Usually, yeah, as Atom mentioned before, the suppliers on their product detail page on Alibaba.com, you can actually find you know a lot of the packaging information uh, and if you log into our uh, you know alibaba.fredos.com uh, you know we actually have a widget there that can help you calculate uh, your CBM and you know there are actually many tools online where you can certainly do that as well so definitely get that information and then from there I think there might be a question later so I'll touch upon like the best way to figure out mode and you know which mode that you should go with um, so I think definitely playing around with the quotation tool again on our website, you know, if you're kind of in between the air freight and ocean freight threshold, right, get quotes for both and see, you know, you have to compare, there's obviously a transit time. So really, uh, the obviously, the cheapest way to ship is definitely for ocean. But you know, if, if your goods are really actually smaller in volume, uh, you know, ocean shipping might not be the best option for you. So it really depends on the quantities and the volume of the goods you're shipping. And actually, great question about the batteries in here. So as I mentioned before, right, so if your products actually contain battery, your shipping options might be limited, especially when it comes to air freight that actually usually have stricter uh, you know, uh, restrictions around, you know, what kind of goods actually uh, the provider can ship. So, you know, in this case scenario, I would definitely get the uh, MSDS uh, material safety data ship, uh, sheet from your uh, from your supplier and then figure it out from there because you might have to actually get multiple quotes and see which particular provider can, right, can, can handle uh, this particular product. So, uh, making sure, and then obviously HS codes, as mentioned before, very important, right? That's going to impact your duties and taxes. So, you know, there's actually a lot of different cost structure or components involved in this entire process. But the only, you know, the more visibility and information you have, the more you can actually be able to assess whether a DDP quote from your supplier is actually fair or not fair, right? Great. Yeah. And, and I think it, another just one thing that kind of touches on all these is the more time you have in advance and the more prepared you are to ask for the right things, to know that you'll need a commercial invoice for, the, for, for shipping, to know that the more lead time you have, the more choices you'll have for selecting the mode, to know who the logistics provider is so you can ask them, do I need an MSDS? Uh, what kind of certificates do I need when I import just in the United States? The more you know in advance and the more those ask you, you ask those questions, the fewer surprises you'll have during the course of that shipment. Um, moving on to the next question here, uh, what items will be charged, customs or duties when they arrive in the US and what carrier options do we have? Uh, yeah. Chen, you wanna take that one? I'll take this one, yeah. I think the general question is, right, all products um, are actually subject to <laughs> duties and taxes when it comes to import into any country in the world, right? So whether it's US, Canada, and Montenegro. So really, I think specifically, it depends on the commercial value, right, of your shipment. Uh, so, you know, let's say shipping into the US, for example, I see some questions are asking for our shipments that are under 800. So US Section 321 is a statute that actually describes the uh, de minimis. So it's a type of entry that allows the uh, shipment's value under 800, uh, you know, to enter into the US border, uh, you know, due free. So under this legislation, right, it, they also permit to enter without a formal entry. So essentially your carrier, let's say, right, you know, in the previous example, you're shipping maybe uh, 30 samples, uh, smaller quantities, they can fit in like, let's say three boxes, you ship them by UPS. UPS can actually claim section 321 by submitting an e-manifest, right, to expedite the clearance process because the, your shipment of the, um, the value of your shipment is actually less than 800. So you don't really have to pay for duties and taxes. But Section 321, however, does not apply to products that are uh, regulated right, uh, by the U.S., let's say, par partner government uh, agencies. So think FDA, think, you know, the consumer, uh, the CPSA, uh, or, you know, goods that are subject to anti-dumping duty 
or uh, countervailing duty, right? So these are sanctions that are, you know, set up to protect, uh, let's say, the U.S. Uh, small businesses or in certain industries. So definitely make sure that you check with your uh, customs broker, right? Um, and if you're, you know, I see that we actually have customers around the world attending the session here. So figure out, right, the de minimis, you know, um, threshold for import into your country. So for Canada, it's 150 Canadian dollars, right? Very different than US. So definitely figure it out your, you know, commercial value from there. And then the mode of transportation. Um, when it comes to carriers, uh, I would say generally carriers are up to date on compliance requirements and regulations. So it's really you, the importer's uh, responsibility to consult and work with the customs broker and ensure compliance. Right, so I think that's definitely important for you to, uh, for me to highlight. We're gonna see a bunch of questions are, are popping in right now about the things you're talking about right here. So Greg asked if I have 50 different supplies and my order will fill a container. That's a good thing. Uh, it basically means that you'll pay less on the shipping, but how would I inexpensively consolidate and what about broker fees for numerous items? So yeah, you'll end up paying a, a customs fee per individual item. Uh, and, and of course doing 50 shipments is gonna end up, 50 different uh, goods is gonna end up costing uh, significantly more. In terms of inexpensively consolidating, what typically will happen is you'll find one supplier uh, and, and try to consolidate by that supplier and possibly pay a little bit extra there. So you can ship all the goods to one place uh, inland and then afterwards consolidate it there and just do the pickup. Um, a question about the de minimis that you were mentioning, 800, does that include the shipping charges or just the cost of the goods, Chen? Oh, that does not. It just, just the product cost. So. Just the product. Yeah, and, okay. I, and I just want to uh, also, we, we have... I think it's been somewhat U.S. centric, but a lot of the uh, a lot of the participants here have been asking questions about foreign importer, uh, who's the consignee, questions around that. So I just want to address that. Um, so the world, thank thankfully, is very global, right? Uh, you can, as a foreign importer uh, nowadays, obviously sell on Amazon. For example, if you're you know based in Europe and you want to sell on Amazon in the U.S. or Canada, or if you're U.S. based and you want to sell on Amazon, uh, for example, in Germany, so or Australia, or et cetera. So this is all supported. Uh, most freight companies that you can uh, work with these days know how to treat uh, foreign importers of record, meaning that regardless of which country your business is registered in, uh, that you can still usually uh, import. Uh, in the U.S., you can, uh, for example, even fill out a power of attorney form, even if you don't have a U.S. Uh, tax ID number. Typically, uh, the uh, freight companies that you book with uh, ultimately are flexible. They know how to get the relevant uh, tin, uh, tax ID number from the ultimate consignee, whether it's a warehouse or third party who may be actually receiving the cargo, even if you're a foreign importer. So if you have any questions around this, these topics around a foreign importer, uh, consignee, tax ID number, et cetera, obviously I'd be more than happy to help answer those questions uh, after the webinar as well. Yeah. Cool. And to know mm -hmm. actually our next, oh, sure. oh, sorry. Um, to know that our next webinar is going to be on FBA shipping. So some of these questions, right, if you're a foreign importer actually, you know, selling on FBA, we'll cover some of these topics on our next session. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely. And, and Ian's asking, where do I get a customs broker? You're in the right place. Alibaba Freight, when you check out, uh, the offers a customs broker as well. Thanks. I promise I didn't pay him to ask that question. Uh, I, I see we're really nearing the end of this. So let's, uh, let's shift to uh, one or two of the last questions. Uh, so I think we touched a little bit on, on reducing shipping costs, I assume that shipping costs for smaller orders, uh, specifically around the de minimis and express shipping for smaller samples. Um, is there any added cost or cost increase due to COVID-19? Do you want to take that or can I? Sure. I, can, I can grab that one. I, I think the closest, oh, sorry, go for it, Ari. I was just going to say that, yes, uh, we're entering what's considered traditionally as peak season right now. This is kind of prior to uh, back to school. And then uh, before you know it, the uh, fall and winter holidays. So ocean rates have been historically uh, very high vis-a-vis uh, -vis last year. Uh, this is really pronounced mostly on full containers, uh, less than full containers. So if you're relatively new to shipping, you will not see mo most of these price increases on LCL, less than full container loads, really much more pronounced on full container loads, uh, as well as air freight. Air freight, there were some significant spikes uh, back in April, May, and June, things calmed down. In July, things have further calmed down uh, on the air freight side. But in general, still preferred, and we always recommend shipping by ocean, either by uh, LCL if you're relatively new, uh, or full container loads. Uh, and then that way you can mitigate your costs as much as possible. 
Yeah, and I mean, you know, for, I think that the, the key takeaway here is that there aren't any specific fees associated with COVID-19. It's really just a matter of supply and demand. If you're shipping when more people are shipping, you're going to end up paying more because uh, it's harder to get on a ship or on a specific plane. Um, I see Riza saying that my supplier has been charging a lot more for shipping uh, charges via air due to COVID-19. Uh, is this a mimic? No, I mean, that's actually legitimate, right? If you think about the number of uh, air cargo, a lot of the air cargo that gets flown into the United States flies on the belly of passenger planes. When there's fewer passenger planes flying, there's less supply. It's much harder to get on the plane. So this isn't necessarily because of COVID-19. It's much more because of the fact that there's fewer flights. Therefore, it costs a little bit more to ship. Uh, that was much more pronounced in March and April. And as I already mentioned, it's really uh, started to uh, return to the mean. Uh, let's finish up with this question. And uh, Chen, you had talked about this a little bit before. So I'll uh, let you finish up with this one, please. Yes, definitely. Um, so really three main modes when it comes to like international shipping here. Um, so one is obviously express, right, parcel or international courier shipping. Uh, so you're familiar with uh, this probably shipping method. So think UPS, FedEx or DHL, uh, if you had to ever ship a package abroad, right? So transit time is usually uh, the shortest uh, three to five days. Cheap is when it's usually less than 50 kilograms. Uh, so think only small parcel boxes for this mode. Air freight, uh, well, it's leveraging, you know, pretty much almost the same speed as courier shipping or express shipping. Uh, it's a bit more complex than express, but less complex than ocean shipping. So you're likely shipping maybe pallets, uh, you know, or a lot more boxes, you know, when it comes to air freight. Uh, usually transit time is, you know, maybe seven to 14 days, could be quicker if you go for a premium option, obviously, uh, but more economical when your shipment is usually between, let's say, 50 kilograms to 500 kg. And shipments are, you know, like I mentioned before, more prone to restrictions on uh, hazardous products. So make sure that you actually ask for the HS codes in advance. And last but not least, ocean freight, you know, most prominent when it comes to B2B cross-border B2B trade. Uh, transit time is obviously much longer, so it does require a bit more planning, but, you know, definitely the cheapest way to ship. Uh, more economical if your shipments are, you know, let's say uh, over 500 kg. Um, so as a rule of thumb, definitely air freight is quicker, ocean freight is the cheapest, uh, you know, and you just have to figure out the volume weights from there and get a few quotes on our platform and figure out what works best for you and plan ahead, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I actually, uh, just to take this out to the last uh, to, to uh, 240 right here, um, Shen, I, I think this is a question that comes up constantly, and I actually have seen a couple people answering, asking this in the chat. So maybe actually let's just finish off with this last question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is a great question. A lot of people ask us that all the time, right? So it really stands for DDP uh, delivery duty paid. So really, essentially, seller pays for all costs and assumes, you know, risks to the final destination to your door, right? So you as a buyer is only, you know, responsible for unloading the goods once they arrive. So DDP quotes from a supplier can be legit. Um, not necessarily they're, you know, um, I would say it can be, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the cheapest or most optimal for you. And why? Because, you know, you think about it, that your supplier has to range uh, pretty much everything, right? Uh, you know, from transportation, cross-border, clearance at destination and origin. Uh, so the DDP unit cost is actually generally much, much higher. So, and, and, and supplier would have to, you know, pick the shipping company and will probably pick one that they like the best, not necessarily the cheapest or most reliable for you. So you're really putting in a, you know, a, you're putting a ton of trust in this shipping company uh, selected by your supplier that you don't necessarily have a say in. So, you know, it might make sense, I would say, in my opinion, to use DDP terms for sample orders or smaller uh, parcel shipments that are valued less. But when it comes to the larger high value freight commercial shipments, um, you know, we recommend actually doing your homework, as mentioned before, to understand the cost components of the cross-border transportation, clearance, duties, and taxes. So you can actually figure out whether you received a fair price from your supplier or not, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, the... The only person I trust to make a product and deliver it well is Domino's Pizza. Beyond that, I think you want to find you want to find the right person to manufacture your goods and the right person to deliver it, and and those are very rarely the same uh, person. Um, so I managed to touch on pizza, so I'm I'm basically ready to call it a, a day. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for for staying so involved and staying so engaged. Uh, Ari Chen, thank you so much for for sharing your knowledge and and for uh, helping out here. Uh, as I said before, all of this content, all of this information, and so much more lives at ship.alibaba.com. 
So head there, you can get, uh, get some more webinars, get some of the historical videos. We'll be doing this again next month. Uh, Shen mentioned that we'll be focusing on uh, Amazon FBA, which is something that comes up a lot. Uh, thank you very much for your time and have a great day.